You know, sometimes people talk about mountaintop experiences. Mountaintop experiences in the Lord. Have you ever heard that, that phrase, that expression? Have you ever had a mountaintop experience uh, with the Lord? When I think about mountaintop experiences, they're often related to music because I love music. And one of the things that comes to my mind at this stage in my life is uh, just worship services like the one we just experienced. Now, I love the fact that we have such a uh, great group of musicians here. Thank you, Courtney, so much for singing that song. It was gorgeous, gorgeous. And there are precious times just to get together and sing and think about the Lord. There are th- times in the past, things that stick out in my mind, both in local churches and also at uh, special gatherings. One that uh, I remember is a Promise Keeper gathering where a stadium full of about forty-five or 50,000 men sang the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. That just about reduced me to tears. You know, just the power of that many men singing such a... And we sang that song earlier. It's a, it's a powerful piece of music that celebrates the Trinity uh, with, in such a regal, regal fashion. And so these are... One of the things that I struggle with, though, is uh, trying to delineate between experiencing the presence of God and enjoying my own emotions. Maybe those two can come together sometimes, I hope. Uh, But I want to make sure that uh, my experiences in the Lord are authentic. That's been a drive of mine for decades now. Uh, I I want it to be real. I want it to be real. We come to a text this morning that is a real encounter with God, no doubt. This is a text that's been special to me for many years. In fact, I memorized it years and years ago. It's a, a memory text for me. It's in Matthew chapter 17. If you want to open your Bibles and get there, get your bulletin out, turn it over. And while I mentioned memorizing Scripture, let me put in a plug here. If you're not memorizing Scripture, please do. Put God's Word in your heart. That's not the only way to do it. Simply reading God's Word uh, in, a, in a prayerful attitude with meditation, considering what you're reading, asking God to reveal to you what He's saying, That puts God's Word in your heart without memorizing it. But there's something special about actually memorizing Scripture to get it into our heart. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, because I think the same thing too. I memorize Scripture, and then I what? I forget. See, the same thing happens to you, doesn't it? Uh, And I have memorized and forgotten Scripture for decades now, all right? And so I invite you to join me. Just memorize it, forget it, and memorize it again. Nothing wrong with that. Don't be ashamed, be proud. So I've memorized that, that one five times, you know. There's nothing wrong with that. Just keep right on doing it. So here's a, here's a great text this morning speaking about the, uh, the mountaintop experience uh, with God in many ways. Matthew 17, verse 1 says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain where they were by themselves. There, Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and His clothes became as white as the light. And look, Moses and Elijah appeared before them, speaking with Jesus. You know, you just want to stop here, take your shoes off, get down on your knees, and worship. What can you say about a text like this? What what words would even possibly be sufficient to comment on a moment like this. There are some things in life that just don't require words. You just experience them. And surely this was one of those moments. This is known as the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, named after the word there in in verse 2 that says that Jesus was transfigured. But let's look at a couple of things here. Matthew starts out by saying, after six days. Now, this is unusual for him. We've been looking at Matthew's uh, gospel now for 16 chapters. And it is typical of Matthew between events to put some kind of transition statement in. But it's usually rather vague when it comes to measuring time. He usually says something like, after these things or sometime later. But in this particular instance, he gets rather specific. He says, after six days. That catches the eye. And so we wonder, why is he being so specific this particular time? So we look back to the end of chapter 16, and we see at the very end of chapter 16, Jesus making a promise, 
saying that some who are standing here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in all of His glory. Now, that's a, that's a, a fascinating passage of Scripture that uh, serious students of the Bible disagree with about what the actual fulfillment of that promise is. But a lot of people believe that it is the transfiguration, the way that Matthew connects the two, that this is at least a partial fulfillment uh, of that promise. And this end of chapter 16 is, is a monumental time in Jesus' ministry also because Peter has just become the first one to, to uh, confess Jesus is the Christ. And, and Jesus commends him for that. Then he becomes the first one to rebuke Jesus and tell him he's not going to go to the cross. Uh, and Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. So Peter's kind of on this roller coaster right now. Uh, he's just been rebuked by the Lord about a week before, and that had to sting. Uh, that, that had to hurt. But Jesus takes him up on the Mount of Transfiguration anyway. He hasn't been rejected. He's just been corrected. And so here he is uh, in, in the presence of the Lord. Mountaintops in the Bible, are just places where people tend to meet with God. And so here they are uh, on the mountaintop, and Jesus suddenly transforms. Transfigure is, comes from the Latin Bible, but the uh, metamorpho, the word, you can hear our English word metamorphosis, just means a, it's a change. Uh, it's a dramatic change. In this case, it's a change for Jesus back to what he was before he was born in Bethlehem. The Bible tells us that Jesus took off his glory, he emptied himself, and he came to earth like one of us to live with us and to die for us so that we could go and be with him in heaven. He's our rescuer. He came to be our savior, our redeemer. And what Jesus is doing here for these three gentlemen is he's showing them a little glimpse of the glory that he set aside when he came to earth, the same glory that he would pick up again when he was finished with his, uh, with his mission here on earth. So just for a moment, they glimpsed it. And, uh, and Matthew says that his face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as the light. He was not reflecting glory. This was glory coming from within him. It is glory that is inherent to Jesus. It's his it's not bouncing off of him, it's coming from inside. This is the real Jesus, the glorified Jesus. Uh, John sees this in the book of Revelation, which we're looking at on Sunday evenings. He said, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned around, I saw someone who looked like a son of man with a robe reaching down to his feet and a sash around his his chest and his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snows, and his eyes were like blazing fire, his feet like bronze glowing uh, in a furnace, and his, his voice like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. This is the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. And John said he fell down at his feet, like one dead. He was so terrified to see Jesus in all of his glory. And here's Peter and James and John, his brother, seeing that same glory, a glimpse of it, for just a moment here on the mountaintop. And more than that, there appears before him, it says, Moses and Elijah. Oh, there's a lot of discussion about why it's Moses and Elijah. Why not somebody else? Why not Isaiah? Why not Jeremiah? Why not bring all of the prophets up there? Why choose these two gentlemen here? It's not hard to uh, understand why Moses would be chosen. He's a mountain in, himself uh, in the uh, Old Testament. Why Elijah? Elijah's a, he's a fascinating, fiery character from the Old Testament, isn't he? And, and another question is, how did they understand? How did they recognize? How did they know that that was Moses? Was he carrying a copy? of the Ten Commandments? We don't know, it doesn't say. How did they recognize that was Elijah? Was he standing in a fiery uh, chariot? We don't know, it doesn't say, but they knew uh, who they were. There's one thing that's clear. Moses represents the law, the written word of God. In Elijah, although we read about him in First and Second Kings, he never wrote anything down that we have in the Bible. And so he represents the spoken word of God. But they also represent the law 
and the prophets. And so what we have here on the mountaintop is Jesus standing with the law and the prophets. And he is the fulfillment of both of them. In fact, we have the law and the prophets and in Jesus, the grace of God. There is the law and the prophets pointing to the grace of God. The onion peels of theology to this go on and on and on. It's a magnificent experience uh, that they've been invited to, uh, to be at. So let's write something down here. What is Jesus doing here, really? What is he doing? Well, he's doing a lot of things, but he, here's what I wrote down for this part of the text this week. Jesus is giving his disciples a preview of eternity. A preview of eternity, a foretaste of heaven, a glimpse of glory. You could put it in many different ways, but he's just showing them who Jesus really is, his exalted state. Now, this is important for these guys because Jesus has just started to tell them for the very first time that they're on their way to Jerusalem and there he's going to be arrested. He's going to suffer many things. He's going to die and be raised again. And that was shocking news to them. They didn't think the Messiah would have to suffer and die. And they may have been having some second thoughts. I don't know. They may have been wondering, is he really the Messiah? I mean, we thought for sure he was. But what is all this talk about suffering and dying? Maybe he's not the Messiah after all. And so Jesus takes them up on the mountain and in essence says, no, you were right the first time. I am the Messiah. And more than that, the Son of God. More than that, I, I am uh, the very essence, the radiance of God himself. Isn't it wonderful? in a, a worship experience or when you're reading your Bible or, or maybe God just catches you off guard and you get a little preview of eternity? Have you had that? I hope so. Really, that's what a mountaintop experience is. is. It's a little preview. It's a little glimpse uh, of just a foretaste of what things are going to be like in heaven. And in heaven, I'm going to be able to run like that again. Yeah, no, no, I, I'm good. Not a problem. Don't ever apologize for what the children do in the church. I love the children in the church. The more noise they make and all of that, not, not a problem. Okay? I love the children in the church. Someday we're going to run like kids again, Jackie. And he'll actually be able to hear what I'm saying, too. <laughs> So here's a glimpse of heaven, and in heaven, Jesus is glorified. <laughs> I guess it just made it to Paul, okay? It, it had to go down the pipe, all right? I'm glad you got it, though. So in heaven, Jesus is glorified, and in heaven, let's not miss this, let's not miss this point. In heaven... All the dead saints are alive again. Moses died a long time ago. Elijah was taken away in a whirlwind a long, long time ago. And nobody knew where he went. They didn't see him anymore. They could guess, but they didn't know for sure. And now Peter and James and John know, I know where Elijah is. He's alive. I know where Moses is. He's alive. The saints are alive in eternity. That's exciting for us to know that there really is a place that we're going to. This is just a journey, and then we cross the river to a better land, okay? And they get to see some of that. Okay, look what happens next. Verse 4, Peter responded, and he said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you want, I will set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. As he was speaking, look, a bright cloud enveloped them, and look, a voice from the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So things continue on here. Peter, Peter, you've got to love him, you know. Uh, right or wrong, he just jumps right out there. You know, he's one of these guys that, that uh, doesn't know how to, uh, to stop himself. That's just who he is. And uh, he's, he's looking at all this, and he's thinking, man, this is grand, this is great, this is glorious. Why go one step further? Let's just camp out right here. He, he says, uh, it's good for us to be here. He wants to put up three shelters. The word that he uses there implies the kind of shelters that they used to put up at the Feast of Tabernacles. 
They used to get together for seven days and live in booths, the old uh, translations used to call them, as a, in memory of the journey that the uh, Israelites had taken on the Exodus so long ago. That it was to remind them of God's salvation. And, and Peter may have been thinking about that. We're not absolutely sure. But one thing seems certain. Peter is happy and he doesn't want to go anywhere. You know, Peter is thinking, maybe all that talk that Jesus had about going to Jerusalem and dying, maybe that's just been set aside now. And, and, and here we are. Jesus is in his glory. Here's Moses. Here's Elijah. Uh, my good friends are here. Let's just stay right where we are. Why go back into the valley? Because there's just trouble in the valley. The mountaintop's a great place. But as he's speaking, this bright cloud comes. And the, the cloud, again, is, is an Old Testament phenomenon of the presence of God. When the children of Israel left, exod left on the exodus from Egypt, a cloud a pillar of cloud by day led them through the wilderness. When Solomon built his temple, which took tens of thousands of, of workers, seven years, it was, it was beautiful, it was glorious. It, nobody had ever seen anything like it. It was loaded with gold and silver and the very best woodwork, uh, the best handiwork that anyone could do at that time on top of the mountain. You could see it for miles. And they all got together to dedicate that beautiful, glorious building. And the cloud of God's presence descended on the temple and the presence of God made that temple look small Solomon said oh, even the highest heavens can't contain you how, how will this little temple that I've built contain you the cloud of God's presence and here are Peter and James and John standing in the midst of the the bright cloud the presence of God and they hear the voice of God speaking this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The exact same words that were spoken from heaven by God at Jesus' baptism. This is my beloved Son. In Him I am well pleased. But then He adds these words. Hear Him or listen to Him. So there's something else happening here. God seems to be saying to Peter, Peter, just be quiet and listen for once in your life. Just listen and get it right. And you need to listen to Jesus. God is saying to Peter, Peter, I know that you and the others are concerned about this valley of suffering and dying, but you need to listen to Him because He knows what He's talking about. Peter needed to hear that. Because the valley that Peter was going to was going to be rough. It was going to be hard on all of them, but for Peter, he was going to deny, deny the Lord three times, uh, and that was hard to come back from. He could. You know, that's how good God is. No matter how low we go, if, we, if we're ready, God will bring us back. But here, God is he's doing something special that it took a long time for me to understand. Let's write it down first, and then I, I want to explain Here's, the question is, why not? Why is, why is Jesus doing this now? Why not do it at the beginning when he first called them so that they would be impressed with his glory and his relationship to Moses and Elijah and, and just follow him? Why, why wait until now? Well, this is a critical moment. This is a turning point. Things have changed, and they're about to get, uh, they're about to go into places that Peter and James and John and the others would never have imagined. And so what Jesus is doing here, what God is doing, the Lord is preparing His disciples for the valley of service. He's preparing His disciples for the valley of service. They're about to go down this mountain. And when they get down into the valley, the first thing that they're going to run into is a man who has brought his demon-possessed son to the disciples to have them heal him, to cast out the demon, and they're incapable of doing it, and everything is just a big mess. The first thing that they hit when they come down from this mountain is a big mess. And it frustrates Jesus. And he says, you, how long am I going to be with you? That's how bad it is. And it's just going to get harder from there as they move their way toward the cross. In my early years of ministry, when things went really well and when there were mountaintop experiences or 
things that came close to that. I would notice that if that happened on a Sunday, I would notice that by Monday, everything had completely fallen apart and I was ready to turn my resignation in. And I began to notice that it happened with such regularity that when something went good, I started doing like this. What's going to happen now? Because I was sure something bad was going to happen right after that. And I began to ask the Lord and ask myself, I said, Lord, what is this? You know, you, you lead us up the mountain and, and we have a, a great experience in your presence or, or whatever it was that went well, and then boom, it's, it's like Satan just comes along to steal it away. God is pr- he's patient. He lets us think about it for a while and then he gives us hints and he slowly opens our heart and mind up to understanding. And finally, the Lord told me, he said, Richard, that's not Satan attacking you when, when you're coming down the mountain. You've got it all backwards. You're looking at it backwards. You're thinking that when you get to the mountaintop, you just need to stay there, but that's not it. I, I can see the valley you're fixing to go through, and I put the mountaintop in front of it to get you ready for it. And I said, oh, oh well, thank you. Thank you. I, I withdraw my complaint. Okay? Absolutely, I withdraw my complaint. Now, if I think about it a little bit more, I might say, well, I might be like Peter. Well, my next question is, why the valley in the first place? Why can't we just stay on the mountaintop? But God is preparing us for something. You know, if Jesus had stayed on the mountaintop at this particular time, none of us would be here this morning. The church would never have existed. Nobody would be redeemed. Nobody would be saved. Nobody would be on their way to heaven. If Jesus had said, I agree with you, Peter. It is good for us to be here. Let's just draw a line and say we're done. Let's stay right here. Then Jesus and Peter and James and John would still be on a mountain somewhere north of the Sea of Galilee, and we would all be on our way to hell. Because Jesus wouldn't go into the valley of service. And he's telling these guys, look, the valley is necessary. There's a mountain on the other side, but you've got to go through the valley. Because God's doing stuff. Look what happens in verse 6. When the disciples heard this, they fell down on their faces, very afraid, very frightened. The NIV says terrified. I've struggled with that word this week. There's something unusual happening here that I'm not sure, even after all these years, that I've completely untangled it. The word is used, uh, phobeo, it's the garden variety word for fear. It's used in many times as a, as a positive fear. There's a, there's a negative fear. There's a word for negative fear in the New Testament Greek that is a, 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 a ter- when somebody's terrorized to the point that they can't do anything. This is that positive fear. Actually, this word can be used both negative or positive. I take it to mean that it's a positive fear here because they're in the presence of the king. And when the king shows up, you get down on your face. You bow down. And they did. So it seems completely uh, appropriate for them to do this. But then look what what happens next. In verse 7, Jesus came to them and he touched them and he said, get up, don't be afraid. That's where I am. If they're afraid and it's good, then why is Jesus saying, don't be afraid? Well, and then it dawned on me. Once again, the words of a song. But it's a good old song. Maybe some of you have heard it. We sing it occasionally around here. One of the verses says this, it was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. You see, what's happening here is God shows up and teaches them the fear of God that puts them on their faces in terror because he is a holy God and he runs a massive universe. He is eternal. He is unchanging. He is unbeatable. People shake their fist at him, but at the end of the day, there is no indictment that will ever stand against him. And when you come into the presence of God, you fall on your face in terror. When Moses realized that the burning bush was God, he fell down. When John saw the 
glorified Lord Jesus Christ, he fell down as though he were dead, he says. So grace shows us God and teaches us to fear Him, but then the mediator, big M, Jesus, the mediator comes and He touches us. I like that, the fact that He touches them. He touches them and He says, get up, don't be afraid. You see, because of Jesus, we can stand in the presence of God. If it were not for Jesus, we would not be able to stand in the presence of God. And then in verse 8, it says, they lifted up their eyes and when they did, they saw no one, Jesus only. Jesus only. So, why not stay? Here's the last sentence on your outline. Why not stay? Why not stay on the mountaintop? The Lord, the Lord is on the move. If they had stayed on the mountaintop, it would just be a mountaintop. Just nothing special. Some dirt, some rocks, a few plants. See, the Lord is moving on. Jesus is always on the move. Because there's a destination, and the destination isn't in this world. So the Lord is moving on. Here's the sentence. The Lord is moving on, and the glory is gone. The glory is gone. It's sad when the glory departs and people just continue to hang on. They don't realize God has moved on. He's doing something else. But we hang on to the past. We hang on to some experience from the past and don't realize that God has something new. He's got a, he's got a new thing that he's doing. And he bids us come. That new thing, by the way, though, requires us to go into the valley of service. So why these three men? Why, these, why Peter, James, and John? He had 12 followers. Why not take all 12 of them up there? Why choose these three? They're, they're called the inner circle, and they, there's a couple of other occasions where they're chosen uh, by Jesus as well. They're an interesting group. Peter, we've, we've already seen Peter. He's the, the one who jumps out. He's in front. He's the leader, and he's going to end up being the leader. He's going to continue to be the leader. Uh, of this group after he gets finished denying the Lord and being restored God doesn't just restore him to a back seat he restores him back to the place of being the leader you know I gotta love I love the way the Lord does things you know when the prodigal son shows up the prodigal son says you know what I made a mistake by leaving I'd be happy just to be an employee and God says ain't no way you're my son you're my son and Peter's the same way you know, Peter said, I messed up. I know I can't be leader anymore. And he says, stop. You are my leader. I said that you were a rock. I was going to build the church on that rock. I'm not changing my mind about that. God restores and rebuilds. And then he moves on. And he does new things. So it's, it's easy to see why he would pick Peter. Why James and John? James is an interesting guy. James is going to be one of the very first of the 12 disciples, in fact, the first of the 12, to give his life for the faith. He's going to be beheaded early in the book of Acts. And he's going to show with his dedication that this new faith that, call, that is called Christianity is going to call on some to seal their testimony with their blood, and he does so. Peter, too, will seal his testimony with his blood. In fact, of these three men, the only one that won't is John. In fact, of the twelve, the only one who won't is John. John, probably a teenager standing on the mountain here, would live till the end of the first century and write the book of Revelation or receive the book of Revelation and write it down and send it to the church on the Isle of Patmos, arrested because of his faith, not, not killed, but arrested, detained. His freedom taken away from him. John is the one that Jesus called the beloved disciple. You know, it's not that he didn't love the other ones, but there was something special about John. Maybe it's because he was the, I almost said the runt of the litter. I don't know why. But he was the young guy, you know. He was the young guy. There's something special about him. Jesus kind of took him under his arm. And so here, here are these three guys that uh, Jesus 
takes. And, but it dawned on me as I came through this passage again this week, prayerfully asking the Lord, what do you want to say about this passage? Because there's so much here. What do you want to say this Sunday morning? And the Lord showed me that these three men, these three men followed Jesus into the valley of service. They were willing to go anywhere to be with him. John went to the foot of the cross. What was it like to watch Jesus die and not know what was going to happen next? These men were committed to Jesus. He gave them a glimpse of glory. He's calling on us to follow him, not just to the mountaintop, but down into the valley and watch and see what he does. Many of you have done it already. You've been there, you know. And we've all been tempted to get to the top of the mountain and stay there. I have. But I found out that if you stay on the top of the mountain, the glory moves on and you get left behind. It moves into the valley and it goes on. And Jesus is accomplishing something, and I want to be a part of it. Do you? I want to be a part of it. I want to see what he does. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? There's a rhythm to our spiritual life. Some have compared it to breathing in and breathing out. When we gather together like we are today here on the Lord's Day, we expect to receive something from God. We breathe in His presence, His power, His truth. And hopefully we leave most of the times, or at least some of the times, full. And then we go out into the world, and we have to breathe out we have to release what it is that God has given us. He doesn't give it to us just to hang on to it. He gives it to us to share it. We talk about it. We share it. We, we serve others. We do whatever it is that he puts in front of us that he calls us to do. And at some point, we, become, we feel like we're empty again, and it's time to gather again and to breathe in. That's the natural rhythm of our Christian life. We breathe in. We breathe out. If we stay in the valley and we only breathe out and we never breathe in, then we will pass out. If we stay on the mountaintop and we keep sucking air in and never breathe anything out, we'll also pass out. Neither of those is healthy. But the rhythm, worship, serve. Worship, serve. Receive, give. Receive, give. That's the rhythm of a healthy spiritual life. What is God calling you to do in the valley of service. Something specific, something that he will empower you to do. Maybe there's an individual in your life that needs to hear about Jesus. Maybe there's somebody who's going through a difficult time and he's asking you to look for an opportunity to pray with them. You may, you may wonder, well, I, I'm not sure how they'll re react to that. I don't know if they believe in prayer. Well, if the Lord's saying pray for them, then pray with them and see what happens. Trust him. Trust him. Maybe God is calling you to do something special at the church and you've been holding back. Trust him. Trust him. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior during the time of invitation, I, I invite you to come forward and speak to me or someone who's up here to, who will pray with you and explain to you that process. Jesus died for your sins. We need to be forgiven. You're not on your way to heaven until you've placed your saving faith in Jesus. If you've never done that and, and God is speaking to your heart and you're saying, I need to do that, then during the invitation, you come forward and let us pray with you and help you do that. Take the first steps of faith. For the rest of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you've heard my question. What is it God's calling you to do? Would you just say yes to him? Maybe you need to come to the altar this morning and say, Lord, I'll do it. Just come with me. Come with me and I'll do it. Whatever it is. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are on the move, that you're accomplishing things, and that you are going to accomplish all that you've promised to do. And we want to be a part of it. We want to be there. We want to see it. We want to be a part of it. We want to share in it. The Bible promises that if we share in your sufferings, then we'll share in your glory. And God, we certainly want to share in your glory. Father, speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's stand and sing. You come. Don't wait.